And, and indeed, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about um, a subject that I think has really sort of captured all our attention because it's always in the news. And the power of infectious diseases is something that has been with us since time immemorial. Ancient writings talk about it. We have many examples of the many infectious diseases that have captured not only our bodies and, and tragically, but also our imaginations. The Black Death, of course, the plague of the 14th century, which had remarkable effects and tragic effects, changing the entire structure of European society, also led to some remarkable literature, uh, the Decameron, for example. And years later, still reverberated in Edgar Allan Poe and many other writings. Smallpox, the only infection that we have actually, human infection, that we have actually successfully driven to extinction. The other one is uh, an animal disease called Rinderpest. Um, I suppose the passenger pigeons had some infections that they may have carried and no longer do, but I doubt they were uh, an issue for us. Smallpox was eradicated in this century, but until then, it killed more people, it's estimated, than all the wars in history combined. And of course, we'll hear more about it later, but it has been used in many ways, both uh, for ill, unfortunately, as it's introduced into new territory, and has the property of killing off people in the new world. The historian William McNeil says that he believes Montezuma's empire was destroyed not by the might of the conquistadores, but by the fact that they brought smallpox with them, a disease that they happened in Europe to have had experience with, and those who survived were already immune, but nobody in the new world knew about it or had it, and it caused tremendous devastation. And that's true of all of these other diseases, which have, for good reason, really grasped our imagination, because these have been cataclysmic events. The 1918 influenza, the so-called Spanish flu, is arguably the greatest disaster in all of recorded history. It's estimated that about 50 million deaths or more, but they keep finding new records in faraway places, were the result of this influenza. And if it hadn't been for World War I, in fact, the flu killed more people than the war, we probably would have uh, considered that the defining event of the uh, early 20th century. And of course, it's become fashionable to be a little bit complacent about infectious diseases in recent years. In 1965, a uh, Surgeon General, not the one who issued the report about smoking, uh, said that it was time to close the book on infectious diseases. And many people thought that that battle, in fact, was something of the past. Unfortunately, that complacency was very rudely disturbed by the great tragedy we call HIV AIDS. And the common thread of these plagues in our own imagination, and of course much literature and much art has come from this long and tragic event, but a reminder to me of all of the different threads that, that make us think of these plagues is a recent documentary about AIDS activism called How to Survive a Plague. So those plagues are still very much with us in the present. Now, since this is about art and science, before I get into the science, I do want to say that despite their rather um, nasty qualities and sometimes even deadly ones, these viruses, uh, which are tiny nanoparticles, really quite literally, you need a, uh, an electron microscope, a very powerful microscope to see them, they're very elegantly assembled and they're very regular geometrically because they don't have the capacity to make very many uh, components, so they have to be able to assemble themselves into these interesting and uh, very functional shapes at the same time. This is a virus called, uh, belonging to the group of noroviruses. Some of you may have had uh, an intestinal infection. This is famous on cruise ships as well. And this is the culprit. The Ebola virus is very fa famous in a picture taken by uh, Dr. Frederick Murphy. Um, 
now in Texas and then at CDC. And here, of course, is, is the object of much of our attention, the influenza virus. A very famous scientist, Lord Peter Medawar, who won the Nobel Prize some years ago, and I'm, I'm sorry is no longer with us, once defined a virus as a piece of bad news wrapped in a protein coat. And indeed, that's what you see here as the influenza virus takes over the cell. And of course, we know from time to time that not only do we get the flu season, tis the season perhaps now, which is predicted with difficulty and varies from year to year, but always you know, troublesome, especially for the elderly, for the very young, for pregnant women and others, but also these pandemics, entirely new strains of the flu that seem to come out of nowhere and that like the Spanish flu, the greatest of them all, unfortunately, and of course we have no way of predicting what the next one will be like, um, sometimes with very great effect, but they spread through the world often in waves. This was the Spanish flu in 1918 at a military camp in Kansas, so you can see what effect this did in fact have when these people went over to World War I, and of course the civilian version. Uh, this was such a great event, in fact, as a, uh, an infectious disease and as a mortality event that it actually caused a spike right here in, in the mortality rate in the United States, which had been going down until then. That was luckily a short term during the period of the uh, pandemic, but I think is a a warning, or at least a reminding us that infectious diseases can't entirely be forgotten. Since then, we've had many other surprises, what I call emerging infections, and these are all the ones you occasionally read about in the newspaper. Um, they may, for a day or two, knock some famous um, sports figure off the front pages, but you know, until things get back to normal. Ebola, which I showed you, all the way down to um, the various influenzas that we've talked about, including those infamous bird flus, which so far have not yet been able to transmit person to person, and which we can't predict, which is what makes it difficult. We don't expect it to take wing anytime soon, but we just simply don't know. This is the same thing from some colleagues, just plotted on a map to show you that we're all in this together. And there are many of these possibilities. The question that interested me was how, in fact, these infections that we've never seen before, like HIV AIDS, how do they appear? Where do they come from? Back in 1969, Michael Crichton, famous for other things later on, wrote a book called The Andromeda Strain, in which he suggested that perhaps he wrote about a virus that came from outer space. And every so often, someone gets a letter published in Nature, of all places, suggesting that some new infection actually fell from outer space. And I began, like many people, to wonder about uh, where these infections are coming from and why they're happening. And to my great surprise, it turned out that many of these already exist in nature. They're infections of other species that simply get the opportunity to um, jump over, uh, to borrow your uh, phrase we were talking earlier, into human beings. Many of them may do nothing, but some of them may be the next HIV or, or the next uh, serious influenza. And the greatest number of these, of course, are in uh, wildlife simply because they're the most numerous and the most widely distributed and the least studied. And of course, we deal with them quite a lot. This was in Cambodia, where these uh, water buffalo may be wildlife, but they come home at night to that um, house over there. So maybe they're also livestock. And of course, the market's famous for the bird flu and many other things, which it turns out influenza has its natural origin with some uh, mixing in other hosts, like pigs, in birds. 
And so ultimately, all the influenza viruses you want to look for are probably out there in wild waterfowl, including many we haven't found yet. Luckily for us, most of these um, infections don't have the potential to infect humans, or if they do, like Ebola, don't have a way to get very far. But we provided ways through human activities like travel and trade and globalization, a major phenomenon of the 21st century. Land use and movement of people and goods with globalization have, are making these events uh, more and more frequent, I'm sorry to say, and more and more likely. So the bottom line is that we have to be aware, I think, of these unintended consequences of our own actions and remember that this is part of the natural world that we will always have with us. We have never predicted an emerging infection and we hope to get better at it. For those of you who are interested, um, I suggest ProMed Mail which some people have call, called the most terrifying news source known to man because it reports on disease outbreaks of these unusual things. Nevertheless, if you want to keep up to date, that's one way to do it. And so my closing message is that th the infections that we see as emerging and surprising to us are out there all around us. They're often brought to us by inadvertent actions that we ourselves do in the environment. And as such, they grasp our imagination, but I think that we will always have to find better ways to deal with them and think about them. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, so I thought I'd start by telling you why I got interested in epidemics. Um, and so it begins with the New York Times Tuesday science section read. Um, I'm a secret or was a secret New York Times Tuesday section reader. So like all stories, there's a good beginning and that's where my work starts. Something captures my attention. It's a headline, a news story, a current event, or even a word. And most often it concerns a condition or an epidemic like flu, um, Lyme disease, or other vector-borne diseases. And I kept, collect and keep these. I call them curiosities. So this, um, I take everything here to my studio. Um, and the work, my work, oh, I think I knocked myself, okay. My work interest lies in how diseases become epidemics, how they affect social conditions, and how those stories are retold. This is some of my research on the flu, and it began with Gina Colada's book titled Flu, the Story of the Great Influenza of 1918 and the Search for the Virus that Caused It. So I didn't know much about this particular pandemic, and I immediately had questions. Things like how many people died, were there any stigmas in communities? Um, were there particular populations that were susceptible? What were the governments and communities doing to protect themselves? Do we have a copy of this pathogen in our government archive now as we do smallpox virus? And could this flu appear again today? So I keep a lot of paper documentation, and that's because this is the story, the story that I'm going to pull from. I consider it a historical memory, and it calls and fuels the mutation I'm going to turn into art. This piece is titled Atmospheric Causes, and it considers the great influenza, also known as the Spanish flu of 1918. During World War I, censors minimized some of the early reports of the illness and mortality, but the papers in Spain, which was a neutral country at the time, were free to report the effects, thus giving the false impression that Spain had been particularly hard hit. By the end of the third quarter of, the, of 2005, um, modern researchers had successfully reconstructed the 1918 influenza virus. Some of the research was done by actually using biological materials. And those tissue samples actually came from preserved um, samples in paraffin stored in government facilities, and also tissue samples from the deceased that were buried in Norway and Alaska. Now, the permafrost in those regions actually protected and slowed down decomposition. 
Spanish flu, of course, involves H1N1 influenza virus. And the creating of this work was actually during 2009 and 2010 during the swine flu outbreak. So I immediately evolved the work to include avian and swine flu, both subtypes of H1N1, and of course, still current day threats. So this kind of history is an important part to the chronicling of the work that I make um, and the connections and the, that I will make. Some of them are going to be literal and some of them are ab abstract. I title most of my work to have a relationship to the influence, or in this case, the influenza. That's my one little ha-ha. So for example, atmospherics causes points to the fact that um, the best route for pathogens to gain entry into our body is through the air, like sneezing. Oftentimes, the forms I might make might have a relationship to the molecular structure of a pathogen. And although I don't identify my work as being data visualization, there are times I do create work that may suggest statistical findings. And this piece is called Extracting In Formation, and it is part of the Influenza series. A guiding principle to my work is summed up nicely by painter Catherine Murphy. All painting is abstract, and all painting is narrative. OK, so both of these slides are landscape, and they depict physical natural elements. The slide on the left is, of course, Van Gogh's Starry Night, and the image on the right is human skin. Both of these are portraits, and they show a person's likeness. Of course, the famous Mona Lisa on the left, and that is actually artist Lori Frick on the right. And she is visually describing herself in the installation using her own personal data that she's collected with regards to her heart rate, the amount of time she sleeps, and her body weight. So I was showing you these so to tell you that I actually see myself as a portrait and landscape painter, that I'm giving the account of molecular, historical, and social fabric of disease. I was invited by the Cape Cod Museum of Art to create a site-specific installation for them. And the mandate of this museum is that the artist and or the work has to have some relationship to Cape Cod. Now, I'm a longtime visitor to the Cape, and so I knew that Europeans had come to that community very early on and that they had brought some pretty serious things with them. In 2009, I came across an article about the eradication of the small, uh, smallpox fire some 30 years earlier, and that became part of my research around the Cape. So I wasn't too surprised to learn that back in 1614 and 1617, the Europeans had exposed the original residents on Cape Cod to the smallpox virus, a disease that they actually had no protection from. This is called the Great Silence and it was influenced by the smallpox virus. It's a 36-foot-long canopy that is undulating eight and a half feet above the floor, comprised of 2,618 individual elements. And this installation had me asking, how can I, how do I use a visual format to disseminate information that is historical, that is um, memory, scientific, and even a little bit fiction? And I've come to that I can do that through beauty, form, and materials. So I unabashedly employ beauty. I make an invitation to each visitor with something like carefully constructed room lighting so that the suspended elements radiate. The alteration of memory is demonstrated through my use of multiples because I believe that if something is meaningful, it's worth repeating. And the truth of the matter is, is that it's not possible to think that the telling or making of the same thing over and over again hasn't led to mutation or exaggeration. So this becomes part of the visual folklore. I'm interested in taking the variant of the same form to the very edge until it's ready to spread again. I paint with molten wax. And each element has multiple layers of paint that can be thought of as skin. And like humans, wax has some fragility to it. If it's dropped, it can break and crack. And like humans, they can sometimes be healed. Just as historical biological specimens were encapsulated in paraffin wax, I'm also presenting wax as a vehicle for preserving the story. 
I have an ongoing interest in vector-borne diseases. Like most of us, I'm concerned with the changes in our climate. Mosquitoes, in particular, thrive in a warmer, wetter world, the, the conditions we're creating now. Implementation of adaptation is my latest installation and has been in process for more than five years. It's comprised of 572 individual elements suspended just 42 inches above the floor. The number suggests the rate of incidence of mortality in New York State of malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, and West Nile virus from 2006 through 2009. With the exception of West Nile virus, the other diseases are the results of infection brought into the US, most likely through global travel, just as Europeans had brought smallpox centuries ago. So the forms in this piece, they might allude to the tubular mouth part of a mosquito, a raft of mosquito eggs floating on the water, or simply abstract elements to break up space. I want you to know that each point of view in an installation is considered. The viewer doesn't have unlimited, unrestricted access to this piece. You're isolated mostly to the perimeter, confined to a select area the visitor is gently pushed aside. You can, however, view the piece by lying on your back, gliding around under the canopy with the elements just inches away from your body, an almost endless view like the sky. This vulnerable position immediately shifts the perspective of macro and micro. Now, most visitors are willing to engage with a piece like this because the installation is subtle, serene, sensual, and beautiful. Now, some view beauty and art as less serious. To quote philosopher Roger Scruton, beauty can be consoling, sacred, profane. It can be exhilarating, appealing, inspiring, chilling. It can affect us in an unlimited and variety of ways, yet it is never viewed with indifference. Beauty demands to be noticed. It speaks to us directly like the voice of an intimate friend. If there are people who are indifferent to beauty, then it's surely because they do not perceive it. In closing, art, epidemiology, social history, share patterns and connections. We each have common interests in conveying critical information to the public with regards to health, economics, race, and politics. And with every story, it's all about how you tell it. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel. I'm also glad that I was the last one because there's so much uh, food for thought that I might actually incorporate some of the previous observations into my own uh, remarks. Uh, I'm a, a social historian of, of public health, medicine, science, and technology. In particular, I have an interest in historical ideas uh, uh, in epidemiology. And as uh, Becky mentioned, some of my earlier work was in the um, area of tuberculosis control. And I'd like to talk to you a bit about that. Um, first, to begin with, though, I want to say that uh, epidemics are, are funny things, and, and as the historian and the kind of you know critical historian, I, you know my kind of uh, you know my first caveat is that we should always think about the social context, you know yada yada yada. Um, but uh, I want to kind of direct our attention to some of the social contours of how we think about epidemics. They're they're interesting things. First of all, they're necessarily abstractions. I don't mean that they're not real. They're certainly real, and I think the previous uh, two talks made that very clear. But our understanding of them is always imperfect. Um, today, and certainly a century ago as well, and quite often our understanding, which is to say our, our, how we conduct epidemiology, is always uh, kind of a socially bound and socially mediated thing. In fact, the, uh, the very pursuit of epidemiology is, deep, is deeply enmeshed uh, with the uh, early history of statecraft. Right? There really is no epidemiology um, before the late 16th century. And a lot of our precepts for epidemiology are from the mid 19th century, in fact. Um, ideas of statistical accounting of, of populations emerged from the project of how do we think about a nation state and its population. Um, and certainly our ideas uh, such as, you know, what is the average human being? Or as um, Adolf uh, Ketele said in the mid-19th century, uh, what is the average man? Um, you know, what does he look like? Um, statistics and social sciences in the social sciences of the 19th century 
uh, of course, were always oriented towards a measure of nation. And quite often, that meant uh, to say, what is a nation? It's also meant to say, what, is, what are the racial contours of one as well? Uh, I'm interested, or was interested, in my first book in the issue of tuberculosis. And it emerged um, from discoveries in the 1880s about its infectiousness. Prior to that, it was usually called consumption. Uh, and it was thought to be a non-contagious, which is to say uh, not a communicable disease, emerging from personal constitution, inheriting uh, you know, who you were. And it was a very romantic disease. These are images from the romantic period where you see kind of you know, people reclining in their, uh, their kind of uh, recliner chair. I forgot, I need furniture historians here, but the, okay, I've stumped myself already. Sh Chez, thank you, Chez, yes, thank you. Um, and uh, it was believed that uh, white consumption and African-American, or say Negro consumption, were two uh, different things. Uh, bacteriological revolution uh, with the discovery of the tubercle bacillus in 1883. Uh, physicians in Europe and the United States eventually came to understand the disease as being communicable. It's a disease of, uh, it's airborne, um, but particularly, as we later found out, conduct or uh, certain environments are conducive to its spread, meaning ones of close quarters, people who are cramped in tenements, undernourished, um, poor ventilation, um, all, it was a disease of poverty, really. Um, and uh, however, even despite this discovery, there were uh, many public health boards and medical societies which still uh, thought about the racial contours of tuberculosis, saying that the reason why African American, the African American population in the United States, which was, keep in mind, about one generation out of freedom, um, or out of slavery, rather, uh, the, the reason why they suffered such high toll from tuberculosis was because of a racial inheritance. And many people actually took that further to say that this was the actual wage of slavery, that this was a race that was most ideally suited, and this is social Darwinism 101, um, a race which had been most uh, appropriately suited for servitude. And so what we saw in tuberculosis was the kind of, was the uh, poor wage um, and tragic result of a, of a race, you know, led to its own freedom, but then which moved to cities to find its fortune, but only found uh, its death and possible extinction, by the way. This is a prediction of the early 20th century. Um, African-American statisticians who are emerging as a professional class of this period, and physicians as well, noted that uh, it was probably linked to poor housing conditions, and one of them was Thomas Jesse Jones, who's, who produced this uh, table in uh, 1906, I believe. Can't see that. Uh, also, W.B. Du Bois uh, wrote a scathing critique of one of the nation's leading um, uh, statisticians, Frederick Hoffman, who predicted that the Negro race would be extinct, probably at the hands of tuberculosis. And Du Bois did his own uh, statistical work and proved Hoffman incorrect. Du Bois, by the way, had been trained in, um, uh, at the University of Berlin, which was the world's leading institution for statistical and social science practice. So he really outweighed uh, Hoffman, but Hoffman got the lion's share of, of the, of the uh, fame for this one or in this debate. Tuberculosis then, uh, in public health departments, mapped on, literally mapped into the terrain of, of black labor and black uh, domestic living. And so in cities such as Baltimore, which is where this image is from, but in cities all around the country, public health departments started to draw public health or mortality maps, and particularly interested in tuberculosis. And they find in each city a thing called a lung block. And when I say they find this thing, they're really encouraged to find it, and they name it. So the map actually precedes the actual terrain. They have a map, they know what they're looking for, and all they have to do is find it. And usually these were areas in, in the south uh, of high black residency and all the kind of ideas of social dysfunction usually attended descriptions of these areas. In the west, they would quite often be in Chinatowns. Uh, New York's lung block was, uh, had two, one in an Irish neighborhood, one in, a, in Chinatown, um, et cetera, et cetera. There, this was all part of a kind of racial continuum. Um, so no one really denied at this point that it was, uh, that tuberculosis was transmissible. The idea, however, was are they, are, are people such as, you know, Chinese, African Americans, um, Eastern and Southern Europeans, were they uh, either genetically predisposed to this disease or were they culturally? Like, could they be educated in how to take care of themselves? This slide makes that point clear here. There was, people were quite exercised over the prospect that domestic servants would, be, would go home and 
get tuberculosis and carry it back to their employers. So this is a photograph from a health department that says this is four generations of consumptives who cannot be educated in how not to spread the disease. Notice that the fourth generation is a, about an 18-month-old infant. I don't think she could really be educated in a whole lot, actually. But that did not escape the person with this, uh, um, uh, this caption. By the way, I don't think these women and this child knew the ends of this photograph. This is actually a kind of staple of Victorian photographic uh, portraiture. And you notice the grandmother with the grandchild on, the, on, the, on her knees. You see this in all types of portraiture in the 19th and early 20th century. And then also the inclusion of the household pet. So I think these women were asked to pose, smile for the camera, and then lo and behold, they show up in the 1910, 1909 Journal of the Outdoor Life, which was a tuberculosis journal, warning white readers, be careful of women like these. Here's a pamphlet saying, our tuberculous Negro, where is he now? Um, warning people to think of that. By the way, the, the pamphlet doesn't really answer that question. I, I, was, I was rather disappointed. I could have ended my research there. Um, uh, Stephen, and just to conclude, Stephen made the point that we lived between the 1940s and the 1980s in a kind of antimicrobial interregnum, where we thought that we believed that we, or we believed that we had vanquished all uh, infectious diseases and we would live, we were at the end of times here. And um, nonetheless, my argument in, in my previous work and in my current work is that epidemics are really, in a lot of ways, our ways of thinking about what are threats and how are threats uh, moving, how do they move from person to person, and are they in fact threats to society itself. So the idea of contagion does not end during this period. In fact, it's through the 1960s where we worry about contagion of dysfunctional family life, right? Like the Moynihan Report, for example. This is a map um, from 1942 where it's pretty clear that we're about to, uh, we have tuberculosis on the run, it's declining, um, but it's, it's still in certain reservoirs, particularly in poor populations. And in this map, which is actually used for the service of bulldozing neighborhoods for urban renewal, uh, it, ma it shows where you might find syphilis and tuberculosis, respectively. And for some reason, those are reasons why we should bulldoze uh, those neighborhoods. Tuberculosis is a disease of housing, where the, 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 the treatment for, or the prevention of which might be better housing, of course. But syphilis is not a disease of housing. So how that maps onto an idea of blight is a very interesting um, logical leap. I'm currently uh, working in the area of epidemiology of drug abuse, which uh, is another, they, my students call me Dr. Death. I have no reason why. I just, <laughs> I tend to find very cheery topics. Um, but as you may know, this was a period in the 1960s, 70s, and for a lot of the 20th century, really, if you include other drugs such as crack cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana even, where you know, we've always worried about epidemics of drug use and you know, juvenile delinquents running amok, crack babies, et cetera, et cetera. And what I argue is that these aren't really, even though people call them epidemics, they're not really epidemics. These are more plague narratives. Epidemics, in fact, um, this is from Time Magazine, these are plague, what these really are plague narratives. Epidemics actually look, classically speaking, more like this, which is to say they go on the rise. This is uh, you know, exempting many of the super plagues that Stephen talked about, but typically an epidemic of a, of a disease might have a rise, it burns itself out at an apex, and then declines. And this is, in fact, what happened in heroin. This is from a, a survey done in Harlem. The surveys in D Washington, D.C. and other cities found the same thing. That is around the time that we were gearing up to pass to uh, the raft of uh, war on drugs legislation, we actually had seen pretty much the end of the heroin um, epidemic. It was always endemic, as will always be drug use. But we had basically uh, not only locked the door after the horse had made its aggress, we also decided to burn the, the barn down uh, as well with these drug laws. Um, so in short, my interests uh, really deal with how we think about epidemics. So I think I kind of lay in between the, the science of epidemiology and the art of its representation, always pointing out as, a, as, a, uh, uh, as the kind of historical watcher that you know, as, as with many things, these things too shall pass. Thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome you all to the conversation part of our evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Becky and the organizers tonight, and I'd also like to thank um, Stephen, Sam, and Lori for, um, for sharing their really fascinating work. I was left with a lot of questions, um, and I hope that you have questions too, uh, because we'll have a conversation up here. I'll be free ranging, um, but also brief enough to allow time for your questions, and I'll ask for those at the end. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. 
Um, yes, thank you. Um, so this is the fourth in a series of talks, uh, Curiosity, that are really geared at putting art and science together on the same page. And I think epidemiology is such a rich um, subject for our conversation because, as we've seen, it's so necessarily interdisciplinary. Um, it is not something that you can simply study in the lab. You have to go out into the world. Um, it belongs in the realm of public policy, needs to be mapped, um, mapped appropriately, maybe. Um, it is uh, something that we need to study in the context of our societies, but that I think can also really hold a mirror up to values of a particular period, and of course has inspired great art, um, from Bruegel to Laurie's work as well. Um, so I really like, uh, to have an interdisciplinary conversation. And to do that, I'm so curious to know your responses really to each other's work. Um, and Stephen, I'm hoping that I can start with you. And I'd just like to know what you made of some of the work that you saw shared. You know, well, I think it was absolutely fascinating. And I think the, you know, sort of the, the large scale, I mean, as you say, making the micro, which is invisible, mm -hmm. you know, macro, which is visible, it's one of the problems we have, I think, with infectious diseases. It seems like, like some sort of, they used to, in fact, think it was a miasma because we couldn't see it. Now we know. But you know, some way to make it visible, I, I think, makes it so much more real. And I had a, I was curious about those who look underneath that installation. What is their reaction when they have this thing, this you know, wonderfully aesthetic, but also obviously representation of a disease, of, of illness, hovering over them? Well, most times when they enter the installation, it's not um, until oftentimes they come out that we're actually, ha I have the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I sit at a lot of my installations. So the first thing is um, I know people are always touching my work because the surface quality is a little ambiguous. So I, I encourage that. Um, um, but that writing underneath, because it's not claustrophobic and there's a perimeter around it, people find it engaging. Um, and then there are, they know that there's some, some biology related to it. They understand that it's organic. Um, and then when I say, well, you know, you were just under an infectious disease or, or my perception of an infectious disease, there's usually a gas and then a conversation. I found it interesting to hear, you know, certainly the science. I thought both of you did such an amazing job as a, as a lay person, someone who has little science background, for me to really grasp what you were both saying. Um, I was particularly drawn to the medical, the history that you bring about, particularly talking about the African American community, um, and that it, the history is so under noticed in the press. Um, and then you're talking about the, um, this, this vast number of diseases that are out on the prowl, so to okay. speak. So uh, I was wondering if both of you could talk a little bit more. I know you're working on a current book, um, but if you could talk a little bit more about the, um, the, the methadone recovery. We were talking about how people um, are involved in that recovery process and as far as certification. And then I, I was interested also in hearing a little bit more about, I know we can't predict <laughs> what's coming up, but there were certainly quite a number of things on that list that yeah. may me catch my breath. So I had two questions. I'm sorry. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Because of course I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, maybe we should start with you then. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm particularly interested in how um, disease, be they epidemic or endemic, mm -hmm. uh, is quite often, uh, particularly in this country and much of the West, mediated by social inequality. Mm -hmm. And so quite often uh, things that we describe as being uh, you know, in, in plague narratives, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah. most of, you know, most of particularly the more dramatic epidemics of history, at some point, usually in the early days or early years, really the depictions, the, let's say, the popular cultural depictions, are really plague narratives. So, if, if, you know, those of us uh, who are old enough to remember HIV in the '80s, um, and then of course with uh, you know any number of infectious diseases and non-infectious ones as well that mm -hmm. it's quite often that we get ourselves really worked up and then that, that often prevents us from thinking about you know how were these how may these be expressions of of inequality mm -hmm. and this ironically well not ironically but uh, interestingly is something that we see even amongst uh, 
uh, they didn't call themselves at the time epidemiologists, but people who called themselves anatomists or physicians or social statisticians, social scientists, uh, uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, you know, kind of posed the same questions. Even while we were, while most of them were not convinced that certain diseases were contagious, mm -hmm. they were. We think of uh, Rudolf uh, Wirchow, for example, who was very much interested in social inequality, but at the same time did not really believe that typhus was a contagious mm -hmm. disease, for example, mm -hmm. but he was very adamant that the poor lived in conditions that mm -hmm. were conducive to poor health. And these were things that were also part of the, the 19th century discussion of what is the state and what does a government owe to citizenry. And these are questions which n would not have emerged, you know, these were not questions that m emerged like during the Black Plague, for example, where there might have been more theological questions. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, do you still see these questions as current, these questions of inequality and how oh, we have a fair representation of the disease? Very definitely. I yeah. mean, there's no question that the major shift in Western uh, society that allowed us to think that we could, you know, sort of push infectious diseases into the background was better sanitation, better living conditions, better nutrition. You know, so that, that's a solution that, you know, is really, really underlies all of this and much of the world doesn't have it, okay. unfortunately. Ironically, at the same time, some of the things we do for development, clearing land, urbanization, and so on, if not done carefully or not done with a view to the possible consequences, could uh, allow some of these infections to get into the human population. So I think in, in some ways, these are very much social issues, but in some ways, it, it's, I, I won't say a double-edged so sword, that's a cliche, mm -hmm. but there are several sides to this, although I think development is very important. It's important to do responsibly. It, Sam, if I may ask you a question, you were talking about two types of diseases, the infectious and the non-infectious like uh, heroin, and I think you made some very interesting parallels. Are we doing something similar with other lifestyle diseases, or maybe it's not appropriate to call them diseases, the epidemic of obesity, for example? Yeah. Oh, boy, you just really pitched in the hard one. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I work in public health, um, but I'm always cognizant of the limits of any one particular approach. So as a historian, I'm often critical of medicalization, yeah. you know, our tendency to kind of, you know, think that certain things are, are part of the medical province and we, you know, they should be under the authority of a physician or a large biomedical institution. Um, I do wonder, and you, when you were talking about development, it also made me think of built environment, which I think mm -hmm. you and I are mm -hmm. thinking on the, on the same page in that. And there's a way in which our built environment today may be conducive to a quote unquote epidemic of, of obesity. Mm. And, this, and when I say built environment, this is an expansive category as well. I really mm. kind of, it's almost, you know, I, I should never use the word culture because that's, you know, that's like nailing jello to a wall. Yeah. Like, that's <laughs> what culture really is. But certainly how we've arranged our lives and, and you know, be it an over reliance on transportation instead of walking. Be it uh, you know lack of access to you know nutritive food, for example. So these are things which we could say belong in public health and should be studied as such, or we could also say they are the province. And I, and I and I shouldn't I'm not even saying this is either or actually and we should also say these are kind of these are proper objects of study for you know people who study you know urban develop, urban planning, for example. So I, I'm a bit, I've, I've basically spent a lot of time dodging the question there. But I'm, but I'm always kind of wary of an over-reliance on a public health approach when, unless that approach is very interdisciplinary and very encompassing of others as well. Um, in representations, by the way, and I, I, I loved your work. I really want to see the, the photographs. I don't even think do the I justice. I knew I should have brought samples. That would have been yeah. great. Yeah. 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 I was on the highway and I went, ah, oh, I forgot the box of pods. Yeah. Yeah. You could have done like Where a beach ball thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Get infected. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a way, and, and Stephen brought out before, I'm not sure, I don't really have a question here, but just a, an observation where Stephen was saying that, you know, we, infections, we, we think of them now on the kind of on the nanoscopic level. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're very micro, and the way you've blown that up yeah. to such a to, to that scale or that scope anyway, mm -hmm. kind of reminds us that re, that scale often is very slippery. That something that is that small actually looms 
very large, large in our lives. I right. mean, we kind of live in a risk society now, right? Mm -hmm. We're always worried. I keep, you know, hand sanitizer with me yeah. all the time. Very, <laughs> Stephen has some I'm a germaphobe. Uh, I, I freely admit mm -hmm. subways make me cringe even though I ride it every day. I still have not disabused myself of those illusions. But those, it looms very large. It's something that we don't see. Mm -hmm. But yet there's, there's a whole system of representations, be they in our, when we took courses or mm -hmm. on the news, where we know it's there. Well, I think science has given me, as an artist, the opportunity to take a look at all the images that you're producing out of the labs. Um, and to, uh, I only see things in a room size, so everything I present is about 300 square feet. So it's the size of a, you know, probably an average New York City living room, yeah. or the size of my studio, or, or maybe a New York City apartment. So. Um, and that's just how I see the I see the world, and I'm presented the opportunity to take something that I actually don't have the liberty to see. Mm -hmm. I only see it on the internet, or uh, I mean, I showed um, material that is what I call over the counter. Okay. The New York Times, Gina Collada's book. She's a you know New York a New York Times science writer. Things that anybody can purchase, going to the newsstand, to Barnes and Nobles, to Amazon. Um, it's th that kind of accessibility. But ultimately, it's that circulation of images mm -hmm. from the Gina Coladas exactly. in the world, from the Mi Michael Crichton, right? Michael Crichton, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. That we know that these things exist. Exactly. I mean, I've, I've, I'm not sure I've ever actually had my eye to an electron, or, to, or okay. I've seen or an electron micro that I've mm -hmm. used one anyway. Um, but yet but I don't know. you want to? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. It's on my wish list. Exactly. But they're a little costly. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's just a way, I guess, that I'm saying that we take it on faith at these things because there's such an economy of, mm -hmm. or a, a kind of a, a, a circulation of these images mm -hmm. that we take it for granted. But then we, I, I imagine you must question this: what is left out of these images when, when we think like HIV today? Right. We know is like a, it's a disease of of structural violence, mm -hmm. right? It's in, in, on a global scale, it's a mm -hmm. disease of poverty yeah. largely. Um, and, uh, but that's not how we thought of it 30 years ago. It was, yeah. this, it was a plague, right? It was right. this kind of monster plague. It was like a hot zone, like a kind of Ebola almost, like we had that kind of visceral fear. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of those reputation, re representations don't bring in the structural, the way like a, a Paul Farmer, for example, in the 90s mm -hmm. and ever since has been okay. encouraging us to think of HIV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, there's no question in there, by the way. I was just, <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. I, Thank I have you. a question, I actually, because I was thinking that um, when I do think about representations I've seen of epidemics in popular culture, like I watched Contagion on the plane, which was terrifying. <laughs> on the that. plane? But, uh, yeah. But I was wondering, what do you hope that people will walk away with a certain emotional response to your work, or are you just trying to kind I'm of just make it tactile? To, and I'm trying to start a conversation or to start some thinking. Mm -hmm. That's really all I'm trying to do, and I believe in the one person at a time. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a lot of power in having contact with one person, one conversation, and just for them to leave thinking. Do you want them not to take these phenomena for granted, or? Uh, yes, that would be true. I don't want them to take it for granted. Um, I want them to think about what their effects are in the mm -hmm. world. Uh, like I'm working on, I have been working on a long series around Lyme disease that I have titled Proper Limits, not knowing, we talked a little, you both were talking about development, proper mm -hmm. you know, development, and I actually, I do see um, human encringement as being um, the biggest problem yeah. for the rise in Lyme disease, and I live in an area where it's really at epidemic proportions. And well, we, we like to build homes in forests, and unfortunately, unfortunately. We, we share you know, many things. And uh, you were in Princeton where you know the deer, which are involved in the transmission cycle of Lyme yeah. disease are very numerous. I lived in fear of them as well. <laughs> <laughs> They're vicious. So did the police. I think they lost more cars from <laughs> hitting deer than anything else. I rode a bicycle. <laughs> Like, Stephen, I actually have a question for you too. I think we were just beginning to see a bit about your mapping project. And I just wondered if you could speak a bit more about 
the aims of that and the methods behind it? Sure, and I, I give EcoHealth Alliance the, the credit for, uh, and Peter Dashak the credit for, uh, you know, really having started this effort to map what they call hotspots, and essentially they're risk maps of where are these infections most likely to occur. The, the problem, of course, is that, you know, these are fairly rare events, and so one of the reasons our predictions are so difficult is because we have so little data on which to base a prediction. We had, uh, I recently heard a uh, talk from the director of the National Weather Service who said, well, you know, um, take heart in the fact that it took us 50 years to get the weather reports that we take for granted and are not always correct today, but you know, that, that are as good as they are. So maybe, maybe we'll still be at it in 50 years, but the idea was to show where these infections are most likely to be found. And these are not surprisingly areas of high biodiversity with uh, significant human population density and often undergoing significant environmental change. All the elements that, that allow you know, people and whatever is in the environment in terms of disease to come together. And that's happening almost everywhere in the world now, so it's getting harder and harder to isolate a few hot spots. Right. Are, yeah. And this is, are these are recent, when you say uh, high population density, you said these are also, are these, um, I guess I can, to borrow the yeah. language of emerging epidemics, are these also emerging population centers, places that 40 years ago might have been small villages, but now house you know, 300,000 people? So, so right now, my or? colleagues, are, it's a good question because I think urbanization is a phenomenon we're all, you know, in many ways um, keeping an eye on. And, you know, the movement from a rural area where HIV may have originally been introduced from some, someone butchering a chimpanzee, we don't know exactly. We think it probably came from chimpanzees in Central Africa around Gabon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that probably, as in the case of Ebola, there may have been people in isolation who you know, never really transmitted it to anyone outside of their immediate family. But now as they moved to the cities, we saw an Ebola outbreak in uh, Kikwit in the mid-1990s, which Laurie Garrett wrote about and won the Pulitzer Prize for. This is a village of 600,000 people, larger than Detroit. You know, so I think that urbanization is becoming you know, a new opportunity. And of course, you know, Hong Kong is a gateway for many infections because it's a gateway to the world. And we are you know, very often a gateway too, uh, usually on the other end, but not always. Uh, this, this brings to mind in the, in the mid 20th century, in the 1940s, we had pretty much thought that we had gotten yellow fever under control. Mm -hmm. And then in Central and South America, it started to spring up. Um, and what we found out is that it was because of highway construction, that these were rapidly, the cities in South and Central America expanded more than any city in the, in the Western Hemisphere, probably in the world. Uh, and there was, of course, highway building, people moving back and forth. And it turned out that it was a, a, a variant of yellow fever where the, there was a, a vector between, with monkeys, but the mosquito involved would feed off of monkeys and human beings. And that's how we had mm -hmm. the zoonotic mm -hmm. leap, so to speak. It seems like there's parallels. And the response then was we had, it was the organization, the Pan American uh, Health Organization mm -hmm. and uh, Rockefeller Foundation yep. set up some laboratories. And they went and just inoculated people uh, all over and, and did surveillance. And uh, somewhere in there is the end of the story. But <laughs> we, we travel much further now and much more rapidly. I mean, space has mm -hmm. been compressed mm -hmm. in yeah, such a way. Is that response, I mean, first of all, are we capable of that? Yeah. Oh yes, and I think yellow fever is a very interesting example because it's one we, you know, it, it seems so familiar in the sense that we hardly talk about it, but we forget that the last yellow fever outbreak in America, they used to have them in Philadelphia yeah. and yes. probably even New York. The last one was 1905 yeah. in, in uh, New Orleans, well, poor New Orleans, but, you know, and, uh, you know, it's not impossible. Yellow fever is now spreading all over Africa for reasons we don't fully understand but may have to do with finding better conditions for those mosquitoes. And new mosquito species that are hardier are also getting introduced into a lot of cities. So unfortunately, too many things are coming together to make these, these events possible. And I actually meant the, I'm sorry, I was, I hope yellow fever doesn't, well, it yeah. won't make the comeback that it had there. But I also no, was not. thinking about how is our response today 
to emerging epidemics similar, better, or not as good as mm. maybe 70 years ago? Like, do you have a? We, I think we're getting better, if nothing else, because we have better tools now. Right. You know, even when we started thinking uh, and asking for you know some, somebody to do something at the government level or the international level, like World Health Organization. In you know 20 years ago, um, we started this thing on the internet. There was no World Wide Web. We got everyone on email that was ProMed simply because they had no way of communicating with people around the world. And it was equally painful for everyone to get on, on, on the internet at that time. Now we have much better communications, much better diagnostics, so we could respond faster. We do lack some political will, and I think we still need political will. But you know, I think you know, as you point out, there this is you know can't be separated from many other things that are happening in the world. Some good, mm -hmm. and and some that you know are going to have negative uh, effects on on health. And so I think you know, in general, we're doing better there. I'm always concerned that we think of this as a zero-sum game, and you know, not only let the best be the enemy of the good, but try to deal with um, all of these problems as if we've got one solved and we can move on to the next. And I, I agree with you. It, it occurs in the social context. We really have to think about it in that way. So I have to ask you, if I may, since yellow fever came up, you mentioned a number of mosquito-borne diseases mm -hmm. and your fascination with, with mosquitoes. Are there some on the horizon, dengue perhaps? Or? Well, um, actually, I, I was talking to Abby. I had dengue fever. I don't oh, advise right. it. Yeah. yeah, I came back from India with a case. Th th this is yeah. a relative of, of yellow fever, but yeah. luckily it's uh, just, just Terribly painful. It was but a nasty not usually fatal. Yeah. I actually um, I have a series of works on paper um, on dengue fever, um, and forgive the title, but it's called Hot and Wet for You. <laughs> um, and so it's actually based on the geographic areas where dengue fever has, um, where we would have expected that it not appear. Uh -huh. And so um, the images are about the molecular structure in relationship to those geographic areas. So um, I see myself staying more with the mosquito transmitted diseases since it has a direct relationship to climate change mm -hmm. and it's it just as prevalent. So I have a question for the both of you, if you don't mind. So I know how, see, uh, how science uh, informs my work. How do you see the arts helping to inform your work? Oh, tough question. Uh, no, 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 actually, um, the, my first slide had, um, one was a, a, a lithograph of some sort, and this, the one that was towards the bottom on the left mm -hmm. was Henry Peach Robinson's 1857 mm -hmm. Fading Away. Mm -hmm. And it depicts a woman dying of consumption. I don't know if you remember the image, but yeah. Yeah. her doctor is staring out the window, and he, the, the image is supposed to be, mm -hmm. this is beyond my power. Mm -hmm. I've done all I can for her. Um, and this image actually was, I got, in, I got involved, I got interested in this because I found that there were certain tropes that were being employed over and over again in public health photography. Not artistic oh, photography, okay. public health, but it's still a narrative, it's mm -hmm. all art is a narrative. Mm -hmm. And so there, I mean some of these pictures, and they're from all over the country, it's mm -hmm. like stock footage almost. Mm -hmm. Like clearly the, the person taking the photograph knew the way to compose the picture so it would have the maximum effect. Mm -hmm. Um, but Henry Peach Robinson used this scene. This is the first use of the camera for art, mm. actually. And this is during the debates of, you know, there were painters who said, this camera is straight from hell. This is, mm -hmm. this is not art. Wow. Mm. It should not even be on this planet. It should be, <laughs> be a good exorcism. That's exactly why it was on the planet. Right, yeah. and, um, and so Henry Peach Robinson's yeah. making this argument. So, and he had a layer take the same photograph over and over again and then cut the negative. So, because mm -hmm. the exposures are all you right. know, different. Um, and this is kind of his, uh, it's a manifesto saying, no, this is art. Mm -hmm. And he takes the most beautiful thing that he could think of, which is a consumptive death. Mm -hmm. And it's very much, you know, consumption was a romantic mm -hmm. way to die. Mm -hmm. um, I think Lord Byron, I think, said that he wished he had consumption because women would find it more interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's, wow. I, don't, I don't think he really meant it. He, yeah. was, he had a very dry wit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably had a dry sherry in his hand at the same time. <laughs> but this is, but you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's a way that art bleeds into our public health mm -hmm. practice yeah. uh, in ways to which that we're not always attuned. So I got involved, that chapter, the art chapter, actually mm -hmm. fell out, my editor took it out of the book, actually. Oh, really? Um, and I never wrote an article about mm -hmm. it either. But um, 
But I, I actually, early in the project, I was always attuned to, to mm -hmm. art, art history and how mm -hmm. it informs what mm -hmm. we think to be quote unquote non artistic mm -hmm. social endeavors. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a very non-scientific answer. You know, the the uh, you know of, of course you know I think there are many ways in which art you know like yours serves to inform and and make us think about these things. But also you know why are we trying to save lives? What is the purpose you know of human existence? And I think you know one of the reasons is to be able to to create and appreciate these things, to be able to do the things that make us uniquely human, mm -hmm. like art, you know, like like the arts and you know one reason to have health and and to be concerned about these infections is that so people can be free mm -hmm. to do these things which as i say is a very non-scientific answer you know but in, in a sense i feel that there you know that may even be more important than than trying to eliminate disease you know trying to express our inner creativity and our you know own humanness mm. a, as you're doing and you know but there's, there's a way, I, I was thinking one of your earlier comments where you said that um, viruses have a particularly elegant design to them. Yeah. And there's certainly, and I, you're not the first one that, I, that I've heard yeah. say something to that effect. I mean, there is a certain kind of aesthetics, mm -hmm. if not an aesthetics to our practice, but at least certain an aesthetic sensibility in how we discern the natural world mm -hmm. around us, yeah. even while we're in the laboratory, right? And I will say, you know, tr truthfully, there, you know, they weren't, Design, they happen to work out that way, but it's a remarkably efficient way to do it. And yes, you know, if, if they didn't have such bad effects, I think, you know, I would find them aesthetic uh, in a different way than I find your work aesthetic, because I think it brings home, you know, other issues of bringing the, the uh, you know, micro to the macro. And, and yet, you know, in the past, because these were invisible, many people disbelieved that they were caused by, by microbes. Mm -hmm. You know, Koch, who, you know, famously discovered the, many of these, you the mentioned the tuberculosis, yeah, yeah. and anthrax, and, you know, famously the cholera um, bacillus, you know, had many detractors, including one who swallowed a, a culture, a virus that Koch sent him, and he, he lived, probably because the culture wasn't very good. But I'm told one of his lab technicians died. So maybe he was the one who really swallowed it. You know, but uh, they, they say that a new theory only uh, gains traction when the uh, believers of the old theory have all died off or retired. Yeah. Maybe Koch was trying true. to accelerate that process. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> Without success. I'm going to take this moment, actually, to open up the conversation to all of you in the audience. I'm going to repeat your question just for the purposes of our recording. Um, so I'd like to start over here. Sure, Lori, this question is for you primarily. Um, so all of you are interested in epidemics, but it's really it's easy to be interested in it once you've been doing it for a while in your career. But um, I'd love to hear how you began to be interested yeah. in it. As an artist who doesn't have any specific scientific background, mm -hmm. how did you come to it? Was it just through those newspaper clippings? And it, they kind of mm -hmm. create a pile, and you realize that they were there, and that was what you're looking Actually, that, it's, uh, that is actually true. So I have been collecting New York Times mm -hmm. articles, and I found myself clipping this, a lot of the same articles. And I actually do keep a ton of paper files mm -hmm. in, in my ongoing need to organize things, realized I had a very large collection on swine flu, um, on, on Spanish flu. Um, and that prompted me at the time um, going through them that I ran into Gina Colada's book. And so it just build for, it builds from there. Lyme disease is different um, in the sense because I live in a community that's really affected by it. I, I have to say that probably in a circle of 10 friends, eight of them mm -hmm. suffer from oh. the disease. I actually have a friend that went undiagnosed for four years with thought she had MS, mm -hmm. lost her job, her marriage, her children, mm -hmm. um, that it took so long. Um, and so I've actually created a series of work based on symptoms that are misdiagnosed. So it, my stum I, I really consider it a stumbling upon. My last science class was a freshman in high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, tell, I was telling my husband on the ride down, I have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Like, <laughs> you know, and I believe in being a Jane of many traits. Like, I think it's important just to have enough to then go on to investigate it. 
Thank you. Or just right. enough knowledge to be interesting. True. Yeah. Thank and you. Dangerous. And dangerous. And <laughs> dangerous. I like the danger part a little. <laughs> Over here. So one of uh, for all of you. So one of uh, one of our collective reactions to the threat of the epidemic is also one of the maybe the most poignant and uh, raw acts of social desperation, which is quarantine. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to interject yeah. just to repeat the question. Okay. Um, so the question really is to the whole panel, and it's about quarantine, how we use it, um, what we think of it. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Yeah, well, you know, that certainly is a very charged word. You know, it, uh, it, it carries a lot of, uh, of, of connotations with it. I think most people feel that, you know, what we think of as quarantine, which means separating out the, the, the um, people who may have been exposed but are not yet sick, and then isolating, we call that isolation, those who are sick, uh, you know, goes back to the Black Death. It goes back to very old days. And although it has its uses, I think we, we tend to sort of overdo it in terms of thinking that this is a panacea. I think social cohesion is much more important because what we tend to see in these situations is a breakdown in social cohesion, as we heard. And I think that people being able to help each other and, and help themselves if they're sick uh, is probably more useful. There was a lot of talk about whether the US should prevent people who are HIV positive from coming in. And there were good public health arguments to say that essentially it, it really would make no difference and have no value. On the other hand, we found many other reasons to exclude people from, from the US, but that's a different story. So in general, I think it makes for good movies, but it has to be applied with great, uh, you know, I, I think with great discretion. For me and in my installations, um, I really, think about how I choreograph people walking mm. through the space in that last mm. installation, Very implementation of adaptation. That perimeter really was um, a subtle form mm. of isolation that, oh. you know, I think I was using the words of gently pushing you aside. Yeah. So um, that was some of that. And also to touch upon that um, social segregation of, um, of when a, a community or a group of people are deemed ill. Qu yeah, quarantine is something I've been thinking a lot about. It just as a, it's, it often comes up, as you said, as a, as a political proposal at some point. So in the early 20th century, you see a lot of people who are advocates for uh, residential segregation ordinances, mm -hmm. incorporating tuberculosis as one reason why we should mm -hmm. make sure there are black neighborhoods and non-black neighborhoods. And Baltimore actually passes the first uh, in 1917. Um, and it's and one of the many reasons that's, that, I forget who it was that proposed it in city council, but one of the many reasons cited was tuberculosis. And then with heroin addiction, um, you know, we saw, I mean, the same thing. It was just the strangest thing. Uh, William Buckley ran for mayor against John Lindsay and uh, Abraham Beam, and he was running on the conservative ticket. And he didn't have a, a chance, but he was, he was running to make a point, of course. And a lot of people agreed with him when he said, well, you know, this heroin thing is, is, is we've tried everything, which we had not really. Um, and one of, the, one of his platforms was we should quarantine all heroin mm. users. And mm. he quite literally mm. meant that. No. Um, I like, uh, Stephen, what you just said about social cohesion, because I think in a lot of ways, uh, except for some of the, you know, in the 19th century, quarantine measures seem to have more effect, or at least as temporary stop gaps. But I think in today's world, really thinking about the social fabric and who are the most vulnerable mm -hmm. people probably would do more than anything. You know, like we said, time and space are completely collapsed in, in our days, so quarantine mm -hmm. is probably not going to help. Yeah. But it's always popular, right? And the CDC still has a division of global migration and quarantine. They still have quarantine stations at you know, JFK, and I have friends who work there. So you know, presumably, it still has a place, but, but used, obviously, with good uh, cause. Wow. Mm. Interesting. Really interesting question. Over here. Um, one, <clears throat> one thing I think about the way the panel's developed so far is that you, you're working with two different paradigms of mm -hmm. epidemics. 
uh, bacteriological one and a uh, public health one. You know, public health being the one that developed with the statistics and maps, mm -hmm. and bacteriological, and sometimes they're, they're, yeah. they're at odds with one another. Um, I did, you know, if you look at the history of the 19th century, how um, there, there's a um, ascension in which you know they resist the idea of, of, of bacteriology because they mm -hmm. want to confine it to a certain yeah. social group, identify it with a certain social group. And I think it would be very, and both, both of these are modern paradigms. Yeah. Right? It would be interesting, I think, in a way, to go take the discussion back earlier and look at, you know, for example, in art, um, depicting uh, um, uh, viruses mm -hmm. or another um, illustration might be a, a <clears throat> map of, you know, the snow, snow's map or something yeah. like that. So, mm -hmm. um, to go back to, you know, the depictions of, um, Homer, uh, the uh, the uh, Apollo shooting shooting the Greeks mm -hmm. uh, arrows at the, at the Greeks in the epidemic uh, uh, that afflicted them, or which is taken up by Saint Sebastian, you know, mm -hmm. depictions of Saint Sebastian in the, in the imagery, mm -hmm. association of arrows coming from from heaven. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I think that there there's whole there are other paradigms. Was, was there a question that you wanted me to pass on? <laughs> it was really interesting, though. Well, I'm yeah. Curious if, if anybody wishes to react. Yeah, I guess a response to um, well, the bacteriological and public health paradigms. Is there another paradigm that we could talk about? Or? I think there's always. I think for I think probably for all of us, the challenge is always finding a different way to think of yeah. something. And I think even within our respective professions and disciplines, there's all. I mean. I mean, I, I won't speak for, for the other two panelists, but I don't think anyone in any discipline or profession that, that everyone moves in lockstep. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's always the challenge to think differently about these things. And and for the, my current interest is in drug abuse, particularly drug abuse treatment history, and the history of of of, of maintenance, methadone maintenance, of decriminalization, harm reduction, and I think some of those ideas that are just now really getting their say on the public stage, such as harm reduction and decriminalization, are, are ways of thinking outside of this knot that we've tied ourselves into. Particularly with, when we think of drug policy, it's either been criminalization mm -hmm. or medicalization. You're either, for all the 20th century, you were one of two. Right. Um, you either believe lock them all up or you believe they should all go to treatment. Whereas now we're kind of thinking that maybe neither one of those is always appropriate and that there are different ways of thinking about these things. And this is just, this is an idea that's been around for you know, three decades or so, but it's only for other reasons that we're coming to really think about them. I just, I just heard today in Paris, they're actually gonna, there's a decriminalized zone, uh, an area where, really? I think it's Paris actually, this, was, this is what happens when, you're, when you walk out halfway through an NPR story. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, it's in France. Driveway. That's right. Yeah, excuse me? It was Denmark? Yeah. Okay, see, I, clearly I, I walked off in the wrong half. Yeah. <laughs> but this was something that was tried, for example, in many places, but um, you know, Baltimore tried it in the 90s, and the mayor and the police chief were roundly, it was, on the wire. It was the yeah. fictionally or, or adapted right to the wire. Mm -hmm. So these are ideas that now it seems might have more traction. We're always thinking of new ways. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more question over here. Right, so it's a question for Dr. Morse. The, um, it seems a lot of pundits criticize the World Health Organization because they come up with these announcements of epidemics mm -hmm. when there's like 17 people that have been infected. But actually, that sort of thing comforts me because it really, to me, shows how sensitive the sensors are for detection of possible contagions that are uh, non-weaponized viruses and bacteria. Am I, am I comforted falsely? And maybe I shouldn't be so blasé because yeah. Well, Should we be comforted? Is the question. I, I think there's still work to be done, but this we have come a long way. I, I, I can tell you that, and there are a few people like David Heyman and others who deserve now retired and in London who deserve particular credit for pushing the the WHO in that direction. It was unprecedented for them to actually issue, as they did during SARS, travel advisories. Although one of them was for Toronto, and the Canadians, being very nice, have since forgiven. 
both us and them. But you know, I think being proactive at least is a step forward. In the beginning of SARS, uh, after ProMed actually had an item on it, the next day the Chinese government admitted they had 305 cases. You know, now they have learned a lesson from that. So I think we are making progress. I think the stigmatization is a serious problem. People see that this could affect trade. But then, of course, you know, once it gets out and people do not believe uh, the governments, then it affects even more. So, so I think that we have made a lot of progress. There is still work to be done. But I am encouraged that WHO, for example, is far ahead of where it was. Uh, on the earlier question, I just can't resist saying thank you. That's a very good question. And I can't resist saying that's a very interesting question also about our different points of view. I think we all you know, do have our, our own points of view. And perhaps art in this way you know, can, can help us all to break out of the mold, find mm -hmm. a synthesis, or be able to focus on a different area. You know, and it probably shows in our presentations. I come from a background in uh, microbiology. And um, you in history and public health. So, you know, I think the contradictions or the differences in viewpoint you point out are very interesting. Hopefully, there are ways to synthesize them. But, but I, I, I do think we all do come with certain preconceptions. Many of my colleagues, when we first started this work, believed that the microbes had to be evolving so quickly that this must be causing all these infections. And it was a great surprise to me as a microbiologist to find out this wasn't true that you know, they were already there, basically. They may have evolved before. They may evolve and will afterwards. But most of them were already here. And it's still hard to convince some of my colleagues of this, this fact. Influenza, by the way, being one of the very big exceptions that does everything. <laughs> Great. So. Thanks. Well, I, I really I want to thank you all for coming to join us on this freezing cold night to talk about this terrifying topic. Well, we have an optimistic conclusion. Um, Stephen, Laurie, Sam, thank you so much. Thank and you. Becky, thank I hope that you'll all consider joining us at the Dinosaur Barbecue afterwards um, to continue this conversation informally. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you. Yeah, thank you.